special number. It's hard to forget a person who blesses you. I don't know if that one, Brother Belial, when was that when we had in Mandawi? 2004. 2004. Brother Belial preached in the Mandawi Sports, Sports Center, and there were 100 people that got saved. Yeah. Isn't that a blessing? Yeah. From that time until today that he comes back. That uh, the thing that what God has done in that area could never be forgotten. And for many of you who were there, you were a witness of what God has done. And what God is going to do if you are faithful in bringing people yes. under the sound of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Always remember this. Brother Belial goes many places around the world. And what a great blessing that he could come here and be with us tonight. Amen? Amen? So, Dr. James Belial, give a big hand of welcome to the pulpit tonight. Thank you. All right, it's a blessing to be here. And uh, the first time I came to your country was in 2001. Uh, I met Brother Wenny Bernisa via the telephone. And uh, he was visiting in the United States a good friend of mine, Pastor Glenn Hamilton, 
and he invited Brother Hamilton to come to the Philippines. Brother Hamilton, uh, he said he could never see how he could do it, but he, Brother Hamilton knew me since, I've, since, since I got saved. And so we were good friends, and he calls me on the phone. He says, I want you to meet this Filipino pastor. And so we got talking on the phone, and one thing led to another. And the next thing I know, I'm on my way to the Philippines preaching for Brother Bernersa. And for the first two or three times that I came to your country, I kept thinking about what I heard when I first got saved about these great evangelists, the Billy Sundays and the D.L. Moody's, these men of God that had evangelistic crusades in the cities. And I remember as a young preacher boy thinking, wouldn't it be great if I could be a part of something like that? And you know, you think about those things when you're young and you got a zeal for God and you, you, it's like a miracle. You, know, you, know, you don't ever think it's going to happen. And, uh, but when I started meeting some of the pastors here and I saw the zeal of the Filipino people and I got to meet Brother Jasalva and his family, I started asking Brother Wenny. I said, Brother Wenny, I'd like to be a part of a citywide campaign. And I think when I first mentioned it to him, he probably thought, well, yeah, that's okay, you know, <laughs> and didn't pay attention to me. <laughs> But I kept bugging him. I kept saying, I'd like to really see this happen. And so through a series of meetings, uh, the truth of the matter is, I got the money, you people did all the work, and you let me preach. <laughs> and so I know the score. But uh, the Lord blessed in 2004. We finally, uh, because of the hard work of the Filipino people, uh, we were able to rent out the uh, Mandalay uh, Sports Complex for three nights. And we estimate about 17 to 18,000 people came to hear the preaching of the gospel. Amen. And total was about 4,000 people that got saved. And uh, that was just a, you know, I'm just a country preacher. And I, I see a lot of youth here. Uh, having youth in your churches is a good sign that a church is healthy. And so I'm thankful that this church, it looks like you're still healthy. And may I say to the young people, don't ever limit God. Uh, you never know what God can do for you, and God, God can do for you and with you. And I'm just a country preacher. I pastored for 11 years, and I was never a pastor of a large church. I was out in the middle of the cornfields of Iowa. I mean, there was 22 houses where we pastored. Did you hear that? 22 houses. But during the, winter, or during the harvest time when the corn was the highest... I would open up the windows and I would preach to more ears than anybody else on the face of the earth. <laughs> Never underestimate what God can do with you. Just be willing to say yes to God. And it's amazing what the Lord will allow you to do. The last time I was here was in 2011. I had a chance to bring my wife with me. And uh, I brought her over to the sports complex in Mandawi City and kind of talked to her about what happened there. And uh, but it's been eight years, and of course, Wenny is now in heaven, and he's the one that got me here, and so I always wanted to come back to the church and to be a blessing to his son, Wendell, and that's why I'm here uh, on this trip. I'm just try trying to be a blessing to him, and the Lord allowed me 23 years ago to start a ministry of missionary evangelism. And I raise money back in the United States so that I can come to different countries and work with missionaries and pastors. And that way they don't have to worry about the expense. And any Baptist pastor that can have a preacher come in and not worry about taking care of them, they think that's a great deal. And so uh, that's how I, I'm able to travel. This is my sixth trip this year. And God's been very gracious in uh, giving me health and uh, but, you know, even as a Baptist, I found out there really is a purgatory. It's called a 14-hour trip on a plane. <laughs> I'm 65, and that trip, that flight that I took from Chicago to Seoul, oh, man, I thought, will this ever end? And uh, things are a little bit different when you're 65 than they were, you know, when I was a lot younger. But I thank you so much for being faithful to the Lord. This church, of course, has been a lighthouse for decades now. And I appreciate your pastor, Kent. He reminds me of my pastor. I have a young pastor. 
Joe Brown is the uh, son of Dr. Larry Brown. Dr. Larry Brown was the one that started our church in Marion Avenue Baptist Church in Washington, Iowa. By the way, a community of 7,000 people. And uh, the reason I have this beard on, I don't like beards. In fact, I hate this beard. One of the reasons I hate this beard is my wife doesn't like to kiss my face when I have this beard on. She said, it's like kissing a toothbrush. And so I don't like that because I like to kiss my wife. But the only reason I'm wearing this beard is because every year we have a live animal Christmas play at our church. I'm talking about inside our church building, we have camels coming down the aisle. No lie. Horses and donkeys and chickens flying everywhere uh, because we offer to our community free of charge, uh, really a theatrical performance. And we're all just common people like you folks. And for about a month of our lives, we just give all sorts of effort and time and prayer and money. And we bring these people in and we have special effects. And I mean, I'm telling you, my pastor, he's got every year, we do something and we're, we're, we're wore out at the end of our live animal Christmas play. And and then our pastor comes next year and says, we're going to do more than we've ever done before. I feel like saying, slow us down, you're killing us. But uh, literally thousands of people come from around the country and hundreds receive Christ as their personal Savior. Because we don't do this just to put on a show. We give the gospel. We don't just show the Christmas story as Jesus boring, but we go all the way through the crucifixion and the resurrection. And then our pastor gives a 15 to 20 minute challenge from the Word of God and hundreds of people trust Christ as their Savior. So I'm doing this for the Lord. I hate these things. It makes me look old. I already know I'm old. I don't need any help. And so uh, anyways, uh, I am so glad to be here. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6. I was with uh, Pastor Danny, is that right? Yes. Pastor Danny this morning in uh, Quito. Quito, I believe it is. The name of the community there? Kyoto. Kyoto? Kyoto. Ki- whatever. I know it started, with a key, it started with a Q and it ended with an O. So uh, forgive me. Anyways, I was with him this morning. And we had a wonderful crowd there this morning, and God blessed us tremendously. Oh, their, their choir did a fantastic job. I was just, man, I, I just was filled with the Holy Spirit there. It was, it was great. So uh, look at Ephesians chapter number 6, a familiar verses in the Word of God. We're going to begin with verse number 10. Ephesians chapter number 6, beginning in verse number 10. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. And I want you to notice that phrase, in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Father in heaven, thank you once again for this evening. And Lord, I pray that you please fill me with your power and help me to be a blessing and a challenge to your people. Thank you so much for all you've done. And Father, we just need you tonight. Thank you for the wonderful report that we heard of all those that were busy out soul winning this week and the number of people that trusted Christ as their Savior, the number of tracts that were handed out. Lord, the ministry to the jails. Lord, we thank you for a church like this, the vision of reaching this uh, country of theirs with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you bless now tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Every once in a while, a Christian will fall. And sometimes it's a person that is well-known, maybe a pastor, maybe an evangelist. And our natural response and our natural reaction to that is, how could that happen? How could somebody that God was using, how could it happen? That a person that, and especially if they've been serving the Lord for many years, and God has blessed their ministry. 
I've been saved for 45 years. I got saved in September of 1974, and I just celebrated 45th anniversary of being saved. And unfortunately, I've seen people fall. And of course, as we think about how could it possibly happen, first of all, we have to remember something, and that is, if it's happened to somebody else, it could happen to us. And of course, God gives us a few verses. If you'll turn there and look at, or look at uh, 1 Corinthians just a few pages back, 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, God reminds us as He was dealing with the Corinthians, He was talking about the children of Israel. And in chapter number 10, in verse number 12, he reminded them, he said, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. And if you look at the previous verses, he was talking about how the children of Israel fell. And he said in verse number 11, Now all these things happen unto them for, an exa- for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. In other words, it says, Look, I'm giving you an example of people that fell. And I'm, I'm admonishing you to realize you've got the same flesh that they had. And they are your examples, but then he gave the warning. And he said in verse number 12, he says, Wherefore him, let him that thinketh he stand to take heed. In other words, pay attention. And whenever I see somebody has fallen, whether it be somebody that was well known, or whether it be a fellow Christian in our own local church, The first thing I try to do, and I consciously do this, is I look in the mirror and say, Jim, you have the same flesh. And if you do not take heed, in other words, pay attention. If you do not realize you have the same flesh that that person has, you can fall as well. You need to stay right with God. I'm preaching to myself now. Why? Because that's what God said here. He says, I'm giving you these examples And I'm admonishing you to realize you can do the same thing. Sometimes we preachers, I believe, hurt our own congregation when we just simply say, well, they probably weren't saved. My friend, that's not the issue. A saved person can fall. A saved person can sin. A saved person can be as wicked as an ungodly person can. All we have to do is read the Bible. Look, why did, why did Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, give us the epistles over and over and over in the epistles? What was he doing? He was warning Christians. He was saying, look, you be careful. Not just in the Corinthian church, but in other churches. The Galatians, he was warning them. So we are capable of falling. And I want to remind us that when we hear of somebody fall, yes, it may grieve us, and yes, we may say, how could it happen? And I'm going to get to that here in just a minute. But the first thing I want to say tonight is you need to listen to the admonition of the Word of God. You have that same same capability. Because when you got saved, your flesh did not get saved. You do not have a glorified body. I wish I had a glorified body. I wish I did not sin. I wish I could take back words I should never have spoken. I wish I could take back actions that I should never have done. And so God gives us the admonition here. But what I want to preach on tonight is this, overcoming in the evil day. Overcoming in the evil day. First of all, I want you to notice that you will have evil days. You will have evil days. What was he writing here? He said in, 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 in Ephesians, excuse me. He said in Ephesians chapter number 6, he said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand well, against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. So first of all, I want you to realize that you are going to have an evil day. In fact, you're going to have many evil days in your Christian life. We will have evil days. And by the way, those evil days will come in many forms. And here's why. Because you see, you have to understand something. The devil has two purposes in his existence. First of all, he has a purpose of keeping people from being saved. 
Because you see, the human race is God's creation. That's, that's, he created us because he wanted to fellowship with every single human being that came into this earth. Is God wanting to fellowship with that human being? Now, why God, who is perfect, would want to create us in fellowship with sinful human beings, that's another issue. <laughs> but he did it. So every single human being that's born, that is God saying, I want to fellowship with that person for eternity. And because Satan is an enemy of God and hates God so much, when he sees every single human being, that's why he wants to keep them and send them to hell. Why? Because he hates God, and therefore he hates anything that God loves. The second purpose is once you get saved, he wants to get you sidetracked from serving God. He wants to get you sidetracked from, for, from serving God. For 45 years I've been saved, and for 45 years Satan has been trying to get me sidetracked from serving the God that saved me. And Satan wants to get you sidetracked, and so he's going to use many different avenues. And so let's just look just at a couple of things in the Word of God here concerning the evil day. You know, first of all, I think about, when I think of an evil day, I think about Job. You know the story of Job. Job loved God so much and served God so much that God bragged on Job. And when Satan came to face God, God said, have you observed Job? I'm paraphrasing here. Have you observed Job? He loves me. And of course, what is Satan? Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And so what was Satan's reaction to God bragging on Job? He says, yeah, well, that's because you got a hedge about him. You won't let me touch him. But if you let me touch him and his family and all that he owns, he'll curse you. And we don't understand everything that went, but God allowed that hedge to be lifted up. And if you want to talk about an evil day, Job had an evil day. Would you not agree with me? In one day, he saw all his wealth destroyed. But worse than that, in one day he saw all of his children gone, killed. In one day. And of course, eventually Satan came back, and that wasn't enough that he destroyed his wealth and he destroyed his family. He said, let me get his body. Let me go ahead and destroy his body. He'll curse you then, God. And of course, God allowed his body to be filled with boils. And can you see Job as he's sitting there in the ash heap and he's got this pot shirt and he's stra- scraping off the boil to try to relieve the, the pus and everything that's causing his pain. And yet the Bible says that Job did not curse God. His wife said, curse God and die. But Job said, I came naked in this world. I'll leave this world naked. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I would say that An evil day is when circumstances come into your life beyond your control. And it can happen to you. I've been saved long enough now that I have had people, though I've never had anything quite dramatic like that happen to me personally, I've known people personally that have had tragedy come into their life. They've seen a child die tragically. That's an evil day. And some Christians... When they face that tragedy, they look up to God and they say, why God? And they get mad at God and they shake their fist at God and they say, you're not fair, God. And why did you let this happen to me? You see, that's called an evil day. So we have to understand something. Evil days will come into our lives and they come in many forms. It could be, as I've already alluded to, it could be that you have a tragedy that is beyond your control that comes into your life like Job did. Or it could be an evil day of temptation. David was at the height of his power. He was now the king. He had endured running from Saul and had victory. He had endured and had had a good attitude towards Saul, the king, and would not kill Saul. When he had a chance to, he could have killed. He could have called that divine providence. And yet he did not do it. He was successful. And now he was king, and he was a successful king, and God had given many victories, but when he was supposed to be out fighting the enemies of God, instead he decided to stay home and take it easy. And the day of temptation came into his life, and it became an evil day because he fell to temptation. You see, an evil day could be when you don't fulfill your responsibilities, and as a result, you end up being tempted, and you fail. 
You see, the evil day can come in many ways. It could be circumstances beyond your control like it happened to Job, or it could be when you do not fulfill your responsibilities. You know something, folks? I want to just tell you something. Uh, Pastor Josalva said something to me tonight. He said, Brother Belial, he's talking about me to me. <laughs> and he said, Brother Belial is a simple preacher. And you know what? He's right. And I'll tell you why I'm a simple preacher. Because I found out that the, the Christian life is really quite simple. Yes, sir. It's really a simple life. That's right. And too often we as Christians make it so difficult. Say, so, oh, what? I don't know what the will of God is. I'll tell you what the will of God is. Get busy soul winning like the rest of those people did last week. That's, a, that's the will of God. So I don't know the will of God. I'll tell you what the will of God is. Get in the book. Get in the book. Read the Bible. Pray. Ask God for his blessings. Get a hold of God. Love God. Serve God. That's the simple life. Amen. Oh, we want some kind of a mystical experience. We want some kind of emotion. Well, look, I'm an emotional guy. I like to cry, I like to shout, I like to laugh. But my dear friend, I found out something a long time ago when it comes to the will of God. You just do the simple things. You get in the book and read the book. You get on your knees and you pray. You get a hold of God. You go out and tell somebody about Jesus Christ. Hey, you walk with God and God will guide and direct you. But I tell you, when the evil day comes, when you neglect your responsibilities, then you become devil bait. You, re you neglect the responsibilities that God has given to you, and you become devil bait. That's what David did. The evil day came into his life through temptation because he did not fulfill the responsibilities that God had given to him. When I think about the evil day, I think about, you know, Paul and Barnabas. They went out and they served the Lord in that first missionary journey. And they had a young man that came with them by the name of John Mark. And I'm convinced that a couple of evil days happened at the same time. One was John Mark, he wasn't prepared for the ministry. And John Mark quit. If you read the life of Paul the Apostle and what he went through, you can tell one thing about Paul. I don't think he liked quitters. <laughs> he did not like quitters. Now, Barnabas was a man that was willing to give second chances. If you remember, it was Barnabas that stood up for Paul. And when Saul got saved and became Paul, it was Barnabas that said, hey, I believe in this guy. I believe he really is saved. I believe that we ought to trust him. I believe God's going to use him. He was willing to give Paul a second chance. But when Paul was not willing to give John Mark a second chance, it was Barnabas that stood up and said, yeah, we ought to take John Mark with us. I'm convinced that the evil day came into John Mark's life, that first missionary journey. He wasn't willing to handle the, the rigors of the ministry. May I say something to you young people that are serving and you're learning the ministry? I want to tell you something. You're going to go through some rigors in the ministry. You're going to go through some difficulties in the ministry. It doesn't matter whether you're an American or whether you're a Filipino. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or whether you're poor. It does not matter. If you're in this thing called the spiritual battle, you're going to face some rigors. You're going to face some difficulties. You're going to face some problems in your life. You're going to have the burdens of the ministry. And there are going to be times when you want to quit like John Mark did. And John Mark faced this, and for a while, John Mark quit. Now, thank God he got back right with God. He came back, and he was serving the Lord, and God used him greatly. But the evil day could be the ministry. You're excited about serving God. You get stirred up by the preaching of the Word of God, and I'm for that. Man, I've been there. That's what the preaching is for. The Bible says that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. But to us, hey, it's what we need. It's our bread. It's our manna from heaven. It's what stirs us up. It's what gets us to have a vision for God. It's what tells us, hey, we need to go forward for God. Yes, that's great. But may I say something? When you get out into the trenches of serving the Lord... It can be pretty difficult. It can be discouraging. You can feel like you are the only person on the face of the earth sometimes. And John Mark faced that and he quit for a while. Paul and Barnabas faced that. You know something? An evil day could be your personal relationships. Paul and Barnabas were called of God. I mean, God made it very clear that he called them together, but they did not get along when it came to John Mark, and the, the Bible says that their schism was so great that they parted one, one from another. And by the way, from that point on, you don't hear anything about Barnabas. Now, I'm not going to judge Barnabas. I'm just simply saying you don't hear anything about Barnabas, but you do hear about Paul and Luke 
and eventually John Mark. So first of all, we need to understand, and that is that the evil day will come, and it comes in many different forms. Christian, you are now in the center of the devil's crosshairs if you're going to serve God. If you're going to do something for God, there's a devil that is your enemy. He is about to, that's what he's talking about here in Ephesians chapter number 6. He is your enemy. He wants to destroy you. He wants to see you not serve God with your life. And so he's going to try to bring evil days into your life. So first of all, if we're going to have victory in the evil day, we need to understand there are going to be evil days. Now I may I confess, I like it when things go smoothly. <laughs> Sometimes people say, Brother Belial, you know, man, you take all these trips and you go to all these different countries and every single trip I sit in one of those planes and I think to myself, why am I doing this? <laughs> my, as my body gets older, my body says, yes, I would like for you to explain to me why are you doing this to me? <laughs> why are you doing this to my body? There's going to be times in the Christian life when you think, oh, this is difficult to serve the Lord. Number two, if you're going to, if you're going to overcome in the evil day, first of all, you have to understand the evil day is coming in many different forms. Secondly, you need to reaffirm your motive. Notice in chapter number six, I want you to notice this. He's talking about relationships here in chapter number six. He's talking about children and father relationship. He's talking about father and children relationship. He's talking about master and servant relationship. But notice what he says over and over again. Look at verse number one. He says, children, obey your parents. Notice the next phrase, in the Lord, for this is right. Notice verse number four, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition. Notice the phrase, of the Lord. Look at verse number five, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, singleness of your heart. Notice the next phrase, as unto Christ. Verse number six, not with eye service as men's pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God. Uh, from the heart. Verse number seven, with good will doing service. Next phrase, as unto the Lord and not unto men. Verse number nine, and you masters do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your what? Master also is in heaven. And then he says in verse number 10, finally, my brother, be strong, what? In the Lord. You need to reaffirm your motive as unto the Lord. Amen. You say, Brother Bob, this is a simple message. That's right. God says over and over again, these relationships that we have, that person that you're having a problem with, they are not the enemy. Yeah. Satan is the enemy. And God is saying, look, if you're, gonna, if you're going to be successful, if you're going to overcome in the evil day, you have to go right back to the very beginning, and that is why are you doing what you are doing? You better be doing it as unto the Lord. When somebody fails, I have met people that they said, well, I looked up to this preacher and he failed and he was a hypocrite and I'm not serving God anymore. You know what that problem was? That person forgot something and that is they weren't supposed to serve in Christ just because of the preacher. They were supposed to serve in Christ. You better go back to the right motive. Folks, Jesus Christ saved me. Jesus Christ changed my life. Jesus Christ gave me this book. Jesus Christ lives within me. He's the hope of glory. Jesus Christ is the master of my life. He is the author and the finisher of my faith. Hey, it's Jesus Christ that I'm supposed to be doing this for. Not some man, not some preacher, not even my wife, and not even my children. Hey, we're supposed to be doing it as unto Christ. Friend, you will fall in the evil day if your motive is not correct. You better be, get, get back to falling in love with Jesus. He's the one that sought me out. He's the one that used my brother to grab a hold of me. I was not looking for him. He was looking for me. For one year, my brother wrote me letter after letter after letter telling me about Jesus Christ. And outwardly, he did not see anything happen. Outwardly, he did not know what was happening inside my heart. But every time I read one of those letters, it was Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God, that spoke to my heart and made me realize my brother was different. It was Jesus Christ I had never heard the salvation story. I was religious. 
I went to church, heard about Jesus, heard about heaven, heard about the Bible, heard about hell, passed all the tests because I was in a parochial school, but I'd never heard the gospel of grace. And then all of a sudden, my brother started writing to me. And after my brother started writing to me, he did not know this was happening. I turned on that radio to listen to my rock music, and instead of hearing the rock music, there was a preacher preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I went to watch a TV program. Now, you got to understand, folks, this was back, I'm ancient. There was no satellite TV. There was no cable TV. The only TV, even in New York City where I was living, was the TV that we got from the airwaves. <laughs> and even in New York City, that was limited. And I went to watch my favorite program, and instead of watching the favorite program, there was a preacher preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He did not know that one day I was on my way from New York City to go back to my hometown in upstate New York, and I stopped to pick up a hitchhiker that was looking for a free ride, and that young man got in that uh, a car of mine, and as we left Yonkers, New York, all the way to Schenectady, New York, I was sitting next to a Baptist ministerial student. He was a member of the Bible Baptist Fellowship in Peekskill, New York. They had a, a in Newburgh or Peekskill, they had a, a, an extension over there, and that Baptist ministerial student preached to me all the way to Schenectady, New York. My brother didn't know that. When I went to that secular university, my plan was to be somebody. My plan, I was going to be known. I was going to be the big man on campus. But there was a God in heaven that had a planted a group of Christians that were at that same university. And I ran into those, those Christians when I got to that college and they started talking to me, inviting me to church. And they finally got me to come to church. And I finally went back home one night after hearing the message. And I thought to myself, God, I want what those people have. And I could hear my brother saying, Jim, all you've got to do to get what they have is to trust Christ. And I said, God, if all I got to do to get what they have is to trust Christ as my Savior, I'm trusting as my Savior. Hey, friend, it was Jesus that sought me out. It was Jesus that came to me. It was Jesus that convicted me. It was Jesus that brought me those people, all those people in my life. It was him. Why can I not serve him even if somebody falls? You need to reaffirm your motive. If you're saved tonight, yes, we ought to look to people. Paul the Apostle said, follow me as I follow Christ. I understand that. But may I want to, I want to say something tonight? You will have people fail you. Somebody will fail you. It might be a father. It might be a mother. I was just with a missionary whose father was very strict and served the Lord in the local church and did right. And boy, I mean, he wanted her, the father wanted the, the daughter to marry the right kind of a person, and she ended up marrying a missionary. And now that, her own father divorced her mother and just a messed up life. People are gonna, people are gonna hurt you. People are gonna disappoint you. People that you look up to, somebody might fail you. When that evil day comes into your life, my dear friend, you better go back to realizing, why are you doing what you're doing? You better reaffirm your motive over and over again. God was saying, he said to the children, he said, unto the Lord. He said to the parents, unto the Lord. He said to the servant, unto the Lord. He said to the master, unto the Lord. Hey, reaffirm your motive. Why are you doing what you are doing? It's Jesus Christ that's the author and finisher of your faith. And if you don't reaffirm your motive, you will fall in the evil day. He was talking about the evil day there. So first of all, he said, we will face evil days, and they'll come in many different forms. Secondly, we need to reaffirm our motive as unto the Lord. Thirdly, we have to understand that faith is the victory. Look what he said here in verse number 13. He says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. But then verse number 16, he says, Above all. We're supposed to have the whole armor of God, yes. But he says, Above all, taking the shield of faith. And notice what he says here. Wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Friend, faith is the only thing that's going to quench the fire. 
The darts may still come, but he says you'll quench the fiery darts of the wicked. We have to realize that faith is the victory, my dear friend. We do not live by sight. We live by faith. And when we see, when our human eyes see that people have failed us, when our human eyes see tragedy come into our life, when human eyes see that things just don't seem to make sense and we wonder where is the God of heaven and we go through the difficulties of life, when those human eyes tell you there is no God, when those human eyes say God doesn't love you, God doesn't care about you, look what you're going through. My friend, you better get that shield of faith and realize the devil is attacking you with his fiery darts and the only thing that's going to give you victory is faith. We sing the song, faith is the victory, and it is the victory. He says you need the faith. That's what Job did. You know why I like the book of Job? Read the book of Job very carefully, and here's what you're going to find out about Job. Job complained. Are you listening? Read it. Read the book of Job very carefully. You'll find out something about Job. He complained. You know, another thing you'll find out about Job, he wishes he were dead. Did you hear me? Read it. We don't have time to read the whole book tonight. Read the book of Job. You'll find out that he wished he were dead. In fact, if you read it carefully, he wishes he had never been born. Are you listening to me? What am I trying to emphasize? Feelings will fail you. Well, I just feel led of the Lord. You better watch it. Feelings will fail you. Job had feelings just like we have. Job had feelings of depression. Job had feelings of what's going on, Lord. Job had feelings of, I wish I would never been born. Job had feelings of, God, why don't you just kill me and get it over with? Yes, read it. Read it carefully. Job had these feelings. But I want you to notice that Job did not act by his feelings. Job acted by faith. He had the feelings that we have. He had the feelings of discouragement. He had the feelings of, why am I even here? He had the feelings of, I wish I were never born. Hey, you folks that are suicidal, guess what? Job felt like, God, kill me. But he didn't act by his feelings. He acted in faith. He acted in faith. Faith is not Folks, you're not always going to feel good when you act in faith. (laughs) Sometimes you are going to say, God, I don't know what's happening, but I go ahead and take the step. (laughs) I love the book of Job because it shows a man that had all the feelings like we do. He wanted to quit, he wanted to die, he wished he had never been born. He said, what's going on, God? I can't understand it. He argued with God. He complained to God. But he acted in faith. And what's the Bible says? There's only one way we can please God. What's that, friends? Faith. Do you realize that God was pleased with Job? All the complaining that Job did, that didn't bother God. you know why? Because Job acted in faith. Yeah. God was pleased with Job's actions because his actions were actions of faith. And God chose to ignore his complaints and ignore the. Now, he addressed those things. He talked to Job and kind of set him straight. But he was pleased with Job because Job acted in faith. Friend, if you're going to have the victory, you need to understand something. It's not about your feelings. It's not about feeling like you're worthless. It's not about feeling like, how can I go forward? It's not about feeling like, how can I do anything for God? Hey, forget the feelings. Have those feelings, but walk in faith. Have those feelings, but go forward in faith. Have those feelings, but keep on trusting God. I have no right to be here today. I have no right to be preaching in 25, 26 different countries. I'm just a country preacher who was a pastor in the cornfields of Iowa. But I have a great God. 
And one day after I took my first missions trip to Nigeria, I came back and I said, God, if you'll let me, if you'll fund me, if you'll take care of me, I'll go forward. I'll help missionaries. I'll help national pastors. Whatever you want me to do, God, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I don't care what country it is. God, I just want to be a help in your ministry. And the reason that God has blessed me is one reason and one reason alone. It's not because I'm a great preacher. It's not because I'm a great Christian. It's not because I was a great pastor. It's only one thing. God has to bless me because I went forward in faith. It wasn't about my feelings. Sometimes people say, well, you, you think you were a successful pastor. It's really irrelevant. It really is. It doesn't make, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters to God is, am I living by faith? And that's all that matters to God for you. If you've been a failure, fine, accept it but move on. If you fail, that's okay. Just go, go forward by faith. Amen. And you can have victory in the evil day. You can overcome in the evil day. Number one, the evil day will come, and it'll come in many ways. Number two, you have to reaffirm your motive unto the Lord. Number three, realize that faith is the victory. Number four, continue the attack. <laughs> continue the attack. I want you to notice that he said, put on the whole armor of God. But what was he talking about? He was talking about attacking Satan's kingdom. I want to remind you when Jesus was on the earth, he said the gates of hell shall not prepare against the, Guess what? He doesn't want us to hunker down in a fortress. He wants us to attack the fortress. Amen. Yeah. He wants us to attack the fortress. He wants us to go forward. He wants us to attack Satan's kingdoms. Hey, what does that songwriter said? Onward, Christian soldiers marching off to war. Folks, if we're going to have, if we're going to overcome in the evil day, God says, keep on the attack. Keep on the attack. He said we needed the sword of the Spirit. Did he not? Yes, he did. He says, above all, take the shield of faith wherewith you shall quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I learned something years ago when I was still lost. I was in wrestling. Did you notice how many times God uses sports terminology in the Word of God? In fact, He uses it here. He says, we wrestle not. Now, if you know anything about wrestling, you're going to find out something. You do not win the match by being on defense. You're not going to win. I was a wrestler. I was not a very good wrestler, but I was a wrestler. And there's something I learned. There's only one way you get points. you got to attack. A takedown, that's attacking the opponent. A reversal, that's attacking the opponent. A near fall, that's attacking the opponent. The only way you win in wrestling is you have to attack. If all you do is be on defense, guess what? You're not going to win. I remember I wrestled this one guy, and the first time I wrestled him, he took me down so fast I did not know what had happened. And before I knew it, I heard the referee go, pin! <laughs> and the match was over. And it was like, what just happened? I'll tell you what just happened. He pinned me. That's what happened. And for that whole year, I thought, if I'm ever going to meet that guy again, I'm going to prepare it for him. And so I prepared, and I prepared, and I prepared. And wouldn't you know it, we came to the final tournament of the year, and he was the top wrestler. And guess where I was at? I was at the bottom. And so we were seated, so he was fighting me. And I thought to myself, that guy is not going to pin me. And for the next five minutes, I was on my back for five minutes. And I mean, that guy was racking up so many points, you would have thought that he was in a football game. Man, I mean, tell, he was racking up the points, near falls, turnover. I mean, he had, he had so many points on there, but he never did pin me. But guess what? I still lost the match. No, he didn't pin me, but he beat me, and he beat me bad. If you're going to overcome in the evil day, the Bible says we wrestle not. What's that mean? We're in a battle. And God is saying, you need to keep on the attack. We're supposed to go forward. We're supposed to go forward in soul winning. I've been soul winning times 
many times, I hate to admit it, where I didn't want to go, my flesh did not want to go. I was making so many excuses in my mind about what I had to do. You know, important things like, you know, take out the garbage for my wife or something like that. But I went. I didn't want to go. My flesh didn't want to go. I went hesitantly, but I went. And every single time that I've made myself go, it never fails that the minute I get to that first house and the minute I start talking about my wonderful Savior, something happens inside me, and all of a sudden I think, man, this is great. (laughs) Bring on the next one. Let's go for the next one. (laughs) Attacking. See, God says he wants us to be on the attack. Too many Christians are hunkered down. Too many Christians are sitting back and they're, oh man, the world's going bad. And Oh, what are we going to do? Our politicians are corrupt and things are happening and the economy is bad. And oh man, uh, the Satan's going to come back and the the, the Antichrist is coming back. Let me ask you a question. You're, You're not telling me anything that I didn't already know. The Bible says he's coming. The Antichrist is going to come. I'll tell you why we got all these computers, man. The Antichrist, I mean, he's ready. Big Brother is watching you. (laughs) I I, I haven't been on Facebook, and all of a sudden I decided I wanted to get on Facebook Messenger, and I didn't know you could get on Messenger without getting on Facebook, so I started a Facebook account. (laughs) And I mean, within the first day after I opened my Facebook account, all these people knew about me. I got all these people wanting to friend me. Now, most of them I knew, but some of them I thought, who in the world is that guy? Folks, I know Satan's coming back. I know he's going to use the Antichrist. But God's not called us to sit back and worry. He's not called us to sit back and and just, you know, oh, man, what am I going to do? And I don't know what's going on. And I'm so worried about this and I'm so worried about that. He's saying, look, if you're going to overcome in the evil day, stay on the attack. Go forward. He said, go forward. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He said, don't be satisfied. I agree with your pastor, Kent, when we were sitting down and talking. He says, hey, we need to get busy and just sending people out, sending missionaries out, starting new churches, and going forward for for, for the cause of Christ. All of us are going to face the evil day. He said it right there in Ephesians chapter 6. But he gave us the recipe. First of all, realize you will face an evil day or many evil days. Secondly, you better reaffirm your motive. Why are you doing what you're doing? It better be for the Lord. Because if you don't do it for the Lord, you will fall in the evil day. Thirdly, he said, not only are you supposed to do it for the Lord and have the right motive, but he said, thirdly, you got to have faith in God. You have to reaffirm your confidence in what God can do in spite of the evil day. And then finally, he said, stay on the attack. I have felt, dif- I have felt discouraged. I have felt like I just couldn't go forward. I felt like things weren't happening the way they were supposed to happen or what I thought that were supposed to happening, but I just kept on going soul winning, kept on going forward. Friend, that's what God wants for you. Yes, we're all going to face an evil day. Yeah. I'll close by saying this. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, your whole life is an evil day. Yeah. Satan has you under his grasp. He has you under his control. And he's going to take you straight to hell if you don't realize there's a loving God in heaven that wants to save you and give you the chance to have victory in Jesus. And I wish that tonight you would call upon him as your personal Savior. You heard my testimony. You heard how I was just going my own way, but it it was because there was a loving brother that told me about Jesus Christ for one year, and finally I got saved. Somebody invited you because they loved you. You came here not by accident, but because there's a God in heaven that loves you and wants to see you in heaven with him for, forever. And tonight you can have victory if you call upon Jesus as your Savior. Christian, maybe you're going through an evil day. Maybe some of you have already faltered and you've fallen or you've gotten bitter, or you've gotten upset because of somebody else that fell. And you think that a bunch of people are hypocrites and maybe you're in this room tonight, but in your heart, you just thought this thing of serving God ain't worth it. I'm saying to you today, you can have victory and overcome in the evil day if you just take the Bible principles and apply them to your life. Why don't you come tonight? Let's all stand for the invitation. Father in heaven, thank you once again that you love us. 
Thank you, Lord, that you gave us the simple recipe how we can overcome in the evil day. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that your will would be done tonight. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Maybe there's somebody here that you're not 